Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Queen's Medical Center's How to Prevent and Survive a Stroke, Speaking of Health Lecture. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lisa Sakia. I'm with Corporate Communications, and on behalf of Queen's, I welcome you this evening. Okay, our format for this evening, we're going to have the presentation uh, first, and then we're going to open the floor up to questions. So we ask if you could hold your questions until after the presentation. And then afterwards, I'll be out in the audience with a microphone so that everyone can hear your question. So we ask if you could just raise your hand, I'll come on over and then you can say your question into the mic so everyone can hear because they might have the same question. Uh, we also ask if you could just ask one question. Some people have multitudes, but you know, um, our doctor's gonna be in the lobby afterwards and you can ask them more questions there so we can hit most of the people here this evening. And now let's get to our main speaker. It is my privilege to give you first the background of our, our speaker this evening, Dr. Matthew Koenig. He is a neurologist. He's also the Associate Medical Director of Neurocritical Care here at the Queen's Medical Center. He is an Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine and Surgery at the John A. Burns School of Medicine at the University of Hawaii. He got his Bachelor's of Arts in Chemistry from Earlham College. He got his Doctor of Medicine from the University of Maryland. He, got, he, was, he did his internship in internal medicine from the Mayo Graduate School, and he was a resident in neurology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. He, was also, he also did his fellowship there in neurocritical care at Johns Hopkins. And he has a diplomate of specialty of neurology and subspecialty of vascular neurology from the American Board of Psychology psychiatry and neurology. Please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Matthew Koenig. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. All right, thanks for, thanks for everybody coming tonight and spending an hour with me talking about stroke. And thanks, Lisa, for the warm introduction. And I wanted to say a few things about myself before I start. I, I'm, I'm a stroke neurologist. So when she says I'm a diplomat in vascular neurology, that basically means I'm a stroke expert. And I'm also an intensive care doctor who specializes in taking care of patients who are critically ill because of strokes and other injuries to the brain. And uh, I did my training in Baltimore, but I've been here in Hawaii since 2009. Um, and I'm working with uh, colleagues here at Queens and the community to really address some of the needs um, that I've seen in my seven years here at Queens uh, for patients who have had strokes or uh, patients who have loved ones who have had strokes. So that's a little bit about me. And now I just wanted to ask a, a few questions about you. Um, and I guess the first question is, uh, who in the room has uh, either had a stroke or has had a loved one had a stroke or been impacted by stroke? Just show of hands. How many people have been impacted by stroke? Okay. It's about maybe a third, I think. And how many people in the room, how many of you know what a stroke is? Who knows what a stroke is? Can you put your hand, hands up? OK. All right. How many people would say that they, they're an expert in stroke, or they really know a lot, a lot about stroke? OK, all right. All right, me neither. <laughs> so all right, that gives me a sense of, of, of who I'm talking to, so thank you. So the, the name of the talk is, is How to Prevent and Survive a Stroke. The best way to survive a stroke is to prevent a stroke. And so that's really the most important part. Um, and so we're going to start with what is a stroke. Okay, we like to confuse people in medicine. I mean, it's, it's a way the doctors like to seem smart is by using terminology that's really not familiar to people and confuses people. And so we'd like to use a lot of words to describe a stroke. And you'll hear me use the word stroke throughout the talk. And I really think using the word stroke is very important because not everybody really understands what a stroke is. And so when we add different terms or medical terms um, that mean the same thing, uh, I think that can just add to the confusion. And so when I say the word stroke, what I mean is ischemic stroke. OK, that's the medical term, ischemic stroke. And what that means is that there's a blockage of blood flow to the brain. And the brain is not getting any blood flow for the period of time where the blood vessel that ordinarily carries blood to the brain is blocked. And the brain really does not have any way of storing oxygen or energy. 
Okay, so if you don't have any, any storage mechanism of energy and there's no blood flow to a part of the brain, then that part of the brain very quickly becomes permanently injured. And in fact, that part of the brain dies. And when that part of the brain dies, it results in a permanent disability. And that's what we call a stroke. And it, it's a stroke because it's something that suddenly strikes a person, right? It's a su very sudden onset of, 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 of symptoms that occur when there's not blood flow to the brain. You know, if you think about what happens when your blood pressure drops very suddenly, if you were to stand up and you didn't get adequate blood flow to the brain, you very quickly become woozy or you black out, right? And that's because the brain, when it doesn't get adequate blood flow, the brain immediately dysfunctions, right? The brain immediately stops functioning when there's not good blood flow to the brain. And so that's very true of stroke. When there's a blockage of blood flow to a particular part of the brain, the brain immediately has a lack of function in that area that ordinarily receives blood flow. And if that um, lack of blood flow goes on for long enough, it causes more and more and more permanent damage to that part of the brain. And eventually, if you don't restore blood flow to that part of the brain, then, then part of the brain actually dies. And that's what we call a stroke. So when I say stroke, I mean ischemic stroke. And that means blockage of blood flow to part of the brain could result in permanent disability if it's not treated. Now, we also like to use this term that I put in quotes here called hemorrhagic stroke, and that basically means bleeding in the brain, OK? And um, I think it's sort of unfortunate that we use the word <coughs> stroke to describe that, because um, it does confuse people, and it's a very different category of, of disease. And so hemorrhagic stroke really means when a blood vessel bursts open and causes bleeding into the brain or around the brain. OK, so you may hear that term hemorrhagic stroke or bleeding stroke. Um, but when I say the word stroke in the rest of this talk, I'm not going to be talking about bleeding in the brain or aneurysms or um, those conditions. I'm really going to be talking about blockage of blood flow to the brain and, re and damage to the brain when blood flow is blocked. And that's what a stroke is. OK, so a little bit of anatomy. There's not a test at the end of this, so you don't have to memorize the anatomy here. But just a little bit of anatomy, because I think it really helps understand um, what happens when you block blood flow to the brain in various areas. And so we're looking at a person here who's facing, who's facing us, right? Here are the ears, and eyes should be here. And down here is the heart, kind of off the screen here. And so coming up from the heart are arteries. Arteries are the blood vessels that carry oxygenated blood from the heart to the organs of the body, including the brain. And so the, the arteries are, uh, are carrying blood from, from the heart when it beats up into the brain, OK? And the big arteries, the big important arteries that come through your neck that are the pulse that you can feel in, in your neck are the carotid arteries, OK? And that's probably a term people may be familiar with. So the carotid arteries, there's one on each side. And it goes up the neck and carries blood from the heart into the brain, OK? So this is the carotid artery here. And it sort of branches into these smaller and smaller branches that go into the skull and then go into the brain and then branch smaller and smaller into, into blood vessels that send oxygen and nutrients that the brain needs. OK. And there's another pair of arteries in the back called the vertebral arteries that go up through the bones in the back of the neck. OK, so this is the same blood vessels now shown. This is a, just a picture, a drawing. Okay, this is a real patient, actually. This is uh, a CAT scan that's done with dye um, in the veins in a real patient. And so we're actually looking at the blood vessels that go to the brain here uh, in this patient. And so these are actually the, the carotid arteries coming up that I showed you. This one on the right side of the brain, sending those smaller branches into the brain. And then this is the carotid artery on the left side of the brain. As you can see, everything in the brain should be mirror opposites, right? It should look the same on each side. And so when you see something that looks not symmetric, it doesn't look the same on each side, there's a, usually a problem in the brain. And so what you see is the carotid artery comes up here on the left, and then it just stops. And that's because blood flow is blocked in this, in this particular patient. So there should be blood flow continuing on into those smaller and smaller branches carrying blood flow into the brain. And so this patient actually has a blockage of the left middle cerebral artery, which is the big pipe that carries blood to most of the left side of the brain. OK, and what that results in, this is, again, this is a real patient here. The, you know, no, no identification, but this is a real scan from a patient that I treated. 
Um, and it's the same patient. So this patient has blockage of blood flow here to the left side of the brain. And this is a scan called a CT perfusion. It's a CAT scan where we look at how quickly it takes dye to enter the brain. We inject dye into the vein, and then we time how long it takes for that dye to get into the brain. And it's a marker of how well blood is flowing into the brain. And so what it shows is as a result of that blocked blood flow, most of the left side of the brain is red here. And red means not getting good blood flow, OK? And so what would happen if blood flow was not restored to this part of the brain is this was the stroke the patient would have, would have this very large stroke involving almost the whole uh, left half of the brain, okay, which would be a very, very seriously disabling stroke. And so it shows really, when, when we do this kind of imaging, it shows what would happen if you did not treat the patient, what would happen if you were, or, or if you tried to treat the patient and you were unable to restore blood flow to the brain this is the stroke that would happen because this is the part of the brain that's really not getting adequate blood flow when the blood vessel is blocked. Okay, and this unfortunately is, is what a stroke looks like when you do an MRI of the brain. This is often done later after the stroke has resulted. And this is um, actually a different patient, but it's an example of what would happen, the amount of brain that would be injured if you were to not be able to restore blood flow. And so this is a, the, the white area of the brain here is the left side of the brain that is now dead or permanently injured or has a stroke as a result of the blocked blood flow to the brain. So this is kind of a, you know, to me indicates really how much of the brain is at risk for, for strokes that involve the large blood vessels at the base of the brain. Okay, and I, I did want to include one picture of a hemorrhagic stroke which is bleeding in the brain, okay, just to draw a contrast, okay. So this image is actually damage to the brain from lack of blood flow, and that's what we call stroke. And this is actually blood, this bright white um, area is bleeding or, or blood accumulating within the brain. And you can see how bleeding within the brain, there's a reason we, we, we use the term stroke to describe that as well, it, it, it causes a permanent damage to the brain that's underneath of that. Um, and it leaves a scar behind and it can cause permanent disability. And so in, in that way it is like a stroke, but it's caused by blood vessels that burst open and spill blood into the brain. Okay, so what are the, what are the most common causes of stroke? Why, why do people have stroke and, and where, where, are, uh, where do blockages that travel through the blood vessels arise? Okay, so blockages can really occur um, throughout the the arteries that I showed you, the carotid arteries and the arteries that penetrate this, the skull and go into the brain. And so the biggest arteries that can get blocked are, are the carotid arteries within the neck, okay? And so this is an example of the, of, this is actually a, an angiogram where dye is um, injected directly into the blood vessels and then we're taking x-rays as, as that dye goes through the blood vessels. And so this is the carotid artery, um, again, in the neck, not in the, in the brain yet. Um, and it branches here and sends off the internal carotid artery, which then goes further up the neck, off screen here into the base of the skull and into the brain. And what you see here is there's a narrowing, a very significant narrowing, um, where blood flow is partially blocked or at least slowed as it goes through that area. Um, and we call that uh, carotid stenosis. That means blockage or narrowing of blood flow to the, uh, to the brain. And this can cause strokes in, in two different ways. One way it can cause strokes is that this narrowing that we're seeing here is actually plaque, okay? And plaque is a term that we use to mean hardening of the arteries. It's a buildup of calcium deposits and cholesterol within the wall of the artery, okay? So the wall of the artery gets thicker and thicker and thicker, and as it gets thicker, it actually narrows the area where blood should be flowing through the artery and partially blocks blood flow. And so that, that plaque accumulates over time. It can really start, um, you know, depending on genetics and lifestyle and, and, and other health issues, can really start in, in late teenage years or early 20s even. And that plaque can begin to accumulate over the course of a lifetime and can cause progressive narrowing of the blood vessels, okay? In addition to that, because there's a lot of blood under pressure is very turbulent. It's, it's uh, coming through that artery at a very high speed, and that turbulence can actually destabilize the plaque there. So that hard, 
hardening of the arteries, that thick um, calcium and, and cholesterol there can actually become unstable and can rupture, okay? Kind of like uh, a volcano, I guess, would be a good analogy. So that plaque can rupture open, and when it ruptures open, it can very quickly cause blockage of the whole blood vessel, okay? And so that's one way strokes can happen from blockages in blood vessels in the neck, is that plaque can accumulate over time and then can suddenly rupture and cause blockage of blood flow to the brain, okay? The second way that it can happen is that little pieces of that cholesterol or that fat within the wall of the blood vessel can break off, okay? And when they break off, remember blood is, is rushing through this area. So blood is coming from the heart, up the artery, and into the brain. And so if part of that plaque breaks off, it, it's actually carried along the bloodstream and goes up into those progressively smaller and smaller branching vessels into the brain. And eventually it gets into a, a blood vessel that's small enough that that little piece of the plaque uh, will block blood flow to the brain. Okay, so it'll, it'll block one of the branches into the brain. And the medical term for that is embolus. Okay, embolus means a piece of plaque or, or, like, or a scab-like material breaks off and is carried through the bloodstream until it gets to small blood vessels in the brain and lodges in those blood vessels and blocks blood flow and causes a stroke from that way. We call that an embolus or embolism is another way of describing that. And then the first mechanism that I described to you where plaque gets thicker and thicker and thicker and then can rupture and block blood flow, we call that thrombosis. That's, that's the term for that, where there's a local blockage of blood flow. So either one of those mechanisms, thrombosis, blockage of the carotid artery, or embolism, where pieces of plaque break off and are carried through the bloodstream, both of those can cause strokes. Um, and this is an important cause of strokes because it's one, of the, it's one of the mechanisms of stroke that we treat differently from other mechanisms of stroke. You know, the reason that's important to figure out why a person has had a stroke is to determine what is the best way of treating that particular person to prevent any other strokes from happening. And so it's important to recognize this type of, of, of blockage um, because this can actually be treated with surgery. Most strokes cannot be treated with surgery. And what I mean is that there's, there's a couple of different procedures where a vascular surgeon or neurosurgeon can do what's called carotid endarterectomy. And carotid endarterectomy means operating on the carotid artery um, to open it up and actually scoop out the plaque. They physically cut through the carotid artery, open it up, and they see that cholesterol build up on the wall of the blood vessel, and they peel that off the wall of the blood vessel and then close, close the blood vessel. Um, there's also uh, another procedure called stenting, where the doctor can put a spring within the wall of the blood vessel to open it up further, and that's done less commonly, but it can also be done. And so this is the rare situation where um, one of the ways of treating either preventing stroke or, or what we call secondary prevention after a patient has had one stroke and we're, we're trying to prevent another one from happening can be done by a procedure or surgery. Okay. So uh, further downstream, you know, again, this kind of continues up from where we left off on, on the slide before, where you're seeing the carotid artery come up from the neck here into the skull and then coming up and branching into the smaller and smaller branches that go into the brain. And so at the base of the brain, uh, in, the, in the large vessels um, that are within the skull, you can also have narrowing and blockage just like you can in the neck. Okay, and we call that intracranial stenosis, meaning blockage or narrowing of the small uh, of the uh, of the larger arteries that are at the base of the brain. And unlike the narrowing in the neck, there's not a surgery that we can do to fix these narrowings, but they are a, a very common and significant cause of strokes, especially here in Hawaii. This is very common. Um, intracranial atherosclerosis is very common here in Hawaii. It's one of the major causes of stroke here. And it can be treated with medications, but this one doesn't have a surgery to fix it at least not at this point. Okay, and then as you get into the smaller and smaller branching blood vessels that go into the brain, you get into very tiny blood vessels that I can't show you pretty pictures of, but they're, um, they're, they're the sort of end artery, meaning they're the last small blood vessel that sends blood directly to the tissue of the brain. And here, this is actually a microscopic picture, not a, not a radiographic study. So this is a slide 
of um, human tissue, and it actually shows that plaque that we were talking about. So what this shows is the, the lumen, meaning that's the place where the blood flows through the blood vessel, and then surrounding that lumen is all this plaque here within the wall of the blood vessel, and it's made up of cholesterol, fats, and calcium. Um, and it becomes very hard and thick. And when those smaller uh, end arteries within the brain become thickened, uh, they can get blocked off. And when they do that, they can cause very small strokes within the brain tissue. And we call those lacunar strokes. That's the, the medical term for that is lacunar strokes, which are very small strokes that occur deep in the brain. And even though they're small, there's a lot of very important areas, uh, very important functions that are controlled by the deep parts of the brain. Because often in the center of the brain are where the cables run that connect the outer part of the brain to your spinal cord and your muscles and control a lot of very vital functions. And so, for example, this little tiny stroke here on the left side of the brain is, is close enough to, the, to the, where the cables run for movement of the right side of your body that this little stroke uh, could actually result in very severe weakness of the right side of the body. And just on, on a personal note, my, my grandmother had a stroke that looked very much like this. This is not her CAT scan, but it looked very much like this. And she uh, had, had paralysis of the right side of her body for, for, ten, for the last 10 years of her life. Um, even though it was a very small stroke, it, it, it really depends on the location of the brain where the stroke happens. And, um, and so even though these are small parts of the brain, they can result in very, very serious disability. Okay, and then the other major cause of stroke are blood clots that form um, not directly within the blood vessels of the brain, but elsewhere, within the heart or the aorta, which is the big pipe that comes off of the heart and carries blood to the organs. And so this is actually an ultrasound of the heart here on the left. It's called an echocardiogram. Probably a lot of people are familiar with that term or have had an echo. An echo is <laughs> an ultrasound of the heart. And this one has a, a very helpful arrow here, which is showing actually a blood clot within the heart, okay? A scab that has formed because of turbulent blood flow or other causes um, within the chambers of the heart. And just like we described with an embolism from the carotid artery, an embolism can also occur from blood clots within the heart. And so if you form a blood clot within the heart, the heart is pumping very hard to pump all that blood out throughout the whole body, including to the brain. And so what happens is little pieces of that clot can break off and be carried along the bloodstream and go into those smaller and smaller blood vessels that go to the brain until it finally lodges in one of those blood vessels and blocks blood flow and causes a stroke. And so um, the embolus or the, or the breaking off of blood clot is very often caused by blood clot forming within the heart. Um, and this is a picture here of a blood clot within the heart. And then to the right here is actually an EKG, which is probably also a term a lot of you are familiar with. And that's a measurement of the electrical activity of, of the heart. Um, and what this one is actually showing is a condition called atrial fibrillation, okay? Uh, atrial fibrillation is an irregular heartbeat. It's very, very common, especially as we get older, the incidence of atrial fibrillation is very high. You probably see ads on television about medications to treat atrial fibrillation. And it's one of the major causes, the major risk factors for strokes. And it's a condition that we see all the time in people who have strokes or warning signs for strokes. It's very, very common here in Hawaii. Um, and it's a, it's a very high risk factor for having strokes. And the reason for that is when the heart is beating irregularly, um, blood flow, blood uh, collects in a, in a turbulent fashion within the chambers in the heart. And when blood is not being pumped out of the heart regularly, little scabs can form within that, within that blood, and those scabs can be carried along the bloodstream and, and cause strokes. Okay, so what are the big, big risk factors for stroke? Um, we, we touched on some of these already. One is a family history of stroke. That's not a modifiable risk factor, meaning you can't, that's not something you can do anything about, but there are genetic factors that uh, are risk factors for stroke. Um, diabetes is a risk factor for stroke. One, having diabetes and also not controlling the, the glucose or the sugar um, if, if one does have diabetes. Smoking is a big modifiable risk factor for stroke, we'll talk about. And then plaque within the large arteries, uh, like we reviewed, atrial fibrillation, 
high cholesterol, and then the one down the bottom, really I should have put at the top because high blood pressure is really the major risk factor for stroke, both the bleeding kind and the blockage of blood flow kind. Okay, so it's the number one risk factor for stroke, and it's very, very common, and, it, and it's also, we say, a silent killer because people have high blood pressure, and unless you measure it and know that it's high, there's no symptoms associated with it, and so uh, the lifetime incidence of hypertension is as high as 50%, which means over the course of a lifetime, half of people will be diagnosed with high blood pressure at some point during their life. So it's very, very common, and it's the, the number one modifiable risk factor for stroke, and I'll show you some of what I mean as we, as we go on. So a little bit about um, how common stroke is, okay, it's, the, it's, it's actually dropped down to the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S., but in, here in Hawaii, it's still the third leading cause of death at this point for a variety of reasons. But probably more important than a, a cause of death, it's the number one cause of chronic adult disability, okay? It's the number one reason that an adult would have to stop working or the number one reason that um, an adult, uh, you know, would, would have to depend on a wheelchair or have to depend on others for care. Um, and so it's a major cause of, you know, really pain and suffering to individuals um, who have had strokes. And, and to kind of put some numbers on that, um, if you were working before you ha had a stroke, the chance of, of being able to return to work after a stroke is only about 20%. So 80% of people have had a stroke are not able to return to the prior work that they did or prior level of function. And so, you know, it, it is definitely a major cause of death, but more than that, it's a real cause of, of disability, of chronic disability um, that, that leads to um, depression and, and suffering and, and, a, and, a, and a burden on people. Just to give you some more numbers, um, in terms of, of, of how common stroke is here in Hawaii, these are, these are local numbers. So these are numbers from the state and looking at different cardiac diseases within the state and stroke is here on the right and there's about 3,100 strokes per year. So a little over 3,000 strokes per year um, happening here in Hawaii. So if you do the math on that, it's about eight strokes per day um, here in Hawaii. So very, very common um, and very disabling condition. Here's kind of, kind of the good news, I think, which is, this is again, these are local numbers here in Hawaii um, from the state looking at the chance of dying from a stroke. And the chance of dying from a stroke was very, very steady for many, many, for decades, really, um, until about 2002. And then gradually over the last um, 12, 13 years, what we've seen is the rate of, the, the chance of dying from a stroke is going down. Um, now, the incidence of stroke, meaning the number of strokes happening, is not going down. So basically what that means is that the chance of having a stroke is stable. The chance of dying from that stroke is going down. So the chance that a person would survive with some disability after a stroke is actually going up, which you know, you know, means that the, the, the burden of stroke on the community, meaning the number of people who are surviving with disability, is actually going up. You know, so the need for services for people who have survived strokes is actually going up. Okay, and, and this is a slide just to show that not all people are affected equally, um, and there are um, different uh, effects of stroke on, different, on, on men versus women, and also among different ethnic and racial groups here in Hawaii. Again, this is local data from the State Department of Health, um, and it shows that especially our, our Filipino community here in Hawaii is really disproportionately affected by uh, stroke mortality, meaning if you're a Filipino, the chances that you die from a stroke are much higher than they are if you're uh, Japanese or if you're, or if you're uh, Caucasian. Okay, so a little bit about what the, what the signs of a stroke are, and this is, I think, one of the most important uh, parts of the talk today, are the ability to, to recognize a stroke when you see it. Like, so if I can accomplish one thing today, that, that would be the accomplishment. And so these are, are, are really the five major symptoms or signs that happen when a person is having a stroke. And it, it's important to emphasize that it's a sudden onset of symptoms, okay? It strikes you, it strikes you down, right? So it's a sudden onset, usually over minutes. Um, it's not the kind of thing that progresses over many hours or days, right? 
The symptom onset is usually, it's kind of, it's maximal at onset. So it comes on very quickly over a few minutes and it can progress for some time, an hour or more, but the, the onset of symptoms is over minutes, right? It's not the kind of thing that slowly accumulates over days. And the other thing is that it really affects one, it affects one side of the body more than the other for the most part, right? And so it's a sudden onset of, of weakness on one side of the body or numbness of one side of the body. It can also affect the ability to communicate, so it can cause slurred speech or inability to understand language or communicate language. Um, it can cause difficulty with vision, either blurred vision or blind spots in the vision or double vision. And it can cause problems with coordination or, or difficulty walking. And so those are the top five symptoms that a stroke can cause. And that's part of the reason I think people have trouble recognizing a stroke as opposed to, say, a heart attack, which is very stereotyped, right? When a person is having a heart attack, it's like I have crushing pain in my chest and I'm sweating and it's going down my arm. And that's, you know, there's exceptions, but it's pretty much the same thing every time. And so it's pretty easy to recognize, okay, if I'm having crushing chest pain that's going down my left arm, that's a heart attack. Whereas a stroke really depends on what part of the brain is involved, what blood vessel is blocked, and so what part of the brain is not getting enough blood flow. And that really determines what the symptoms are. And it can be very, very different depending on which blood vessel is blocked and which part of the brain is involved. And so it's a little bit harder, I think, for people to recognize because it's not the same for every person who's had a stroke. Okay. And it's kind of like what realtors will tell you. It's like location, location, location. So it's what, part, what location in the brain is not getting blood flow really determines what the symptoms and signs of that stroke are. Okay, and so a few examples here. So the brain is cross-wired. So the right side of the brain controls movement and feeling of the left side of the body. And the left side of the brain controls movement and feeling of the right side of the body. And so in this example, this is a, a person who's had a stroke involving the right side of the brain. That's this big dark spot. And here this uh, drawing of this woman, she's having weakness of the left arm. So she's being asked to hold her arms out in front of her and the left arm is dropping, a sign of weakness of the left arm, and that would be associated with a stroke of the right side of the brain. So again, the point to emphasize is that stroke causes symptoms on one side of the body more than others, for the most part. Okay, and for most people who are right-handed, okay, and most, most individu individuals are right-handed, and even actually for most lefties as well, the language is on the left side of the brain, okay? You hear about people who are like left brain, right brain, right? Some of that is just kind of lower, but the language, uh, meaning understanding what's being said to you and understanding written language, being able to speak, being able to write down words, that language controls on the left side of the brain for 95 plus percent of individuals. And so here, uh, you know, we like to confuse people in medicine, right? So this is left, even though to you this may look like the right side, this is actually the left side of the brain. And so there's a stroke here on the left side of the brain, on this MRI, and that produces a language problem that we call aphasia. Okay, aphasia is the medical term that we use to describe people who are having difficulty with language. And that, that doesn't mean slurred speech, it means inability to communicate, and sometimes people who are having stroke communicate in a, in a, in a gibberish. That it sounds like words, um, and they can be struggling to get words out, but the words are like a word salad. They don't really make any sense. It sounds like they're trying to speak a foreign language. And in fact, people who have aphasia often have trouble understanding what's being said to them. So if you try and speak to a person who's having language problems from a stroke, they may not understand the, the words that you're using, and they may not be able to communicate what they're, the symptoms that they're having because of this problem. Okay, and then here's another location of a stroke. This is a stroke in the back part of the brain called the occipital lobe. And that's the part of the brain that controls vision. And again, the brain is cross-wired. And so this is a, a stroke on the right occipital lobe in the vision area, and that would cause a blind spot to the left side. And often people, you know, unless you're seeing flashing lights and things, people don't actually recognize that they have blind spots, and they don't report blind spots. When I see patients who have vision problems from stroke, they don't come in and say, I have a blind spot to the left side. What they say is, I'm bumping into things on my left side, right? Because they actually don't see over here, but they don't recognize that they're not seeing over there because it's not a prominent symptom. 
And so what they'll come and report to you is I keep bumping into things on the left side, or I've even, in, in serious cases, I've seen people get into car crashes because they're trying to switch lanes, but they have a blind spot on the left that they don't recognize, and there's a car there. And so vision, vision problems from strokes can be um, very subtle, and it's just something to keep your, your antenna up for that if you know, somebody isn't acting right and they're bumping into things and seemingly not seeing, that can be a sign of a stroke. Okay, and then the other big symptom is problems with balance and coordination, and this is the cerebellum, the balance part of the brain, um, and that can control how we coordinate our movements, and so people can seem drunk, um, can walk in a way that seems drunk and staggering around, and that can be a sign that a person is having a stroke. So a person who is not drunk and has sudden onset of, of walking like they're drunk, meaning staggering around or falling to one side, that's a very common sign that a person um, could be having a stroke. So these are signs to look out for. Okay, and it's hard to remember all that. Again, it's complicated. It's different for different people. And so American Heart Association and other groups have been using this memory tool called Act Fast for many years now, and some of you may be hopefully familiar with Act Fast. And Act Fast um, refers to F-A-S-T, so fast is face, meaning droopiness of one side of the face. Um, arm weakness, meaning weakness of one arm. Speech problems, like we talked about, either slurred speech or, or speaking gibberish or aphasia. And then T is time to call 911. Okay, so some examples of act fast here. You have a, a gentleman on the right side whose face is at rest. You wouldn't notice that he has a facial droop. But if you ask him to smile, then you'll notice that he's only smiling with the left side of the face, and there's a droopiness of the right side of the face. Facial droop can be very subtle if you don't ask a person to smile. And so if you're concerned that, God forbid, you're having a stroke or a loved one is having a stroke, ask them to smile and see if the face is droopy on one side. Okay? And similarly, the FA A is the arm weakness. And so you can't tell if somebody's arm is weak at rest, so you ask the person to hold their arms in the air. And if one arm drifts down, then that is a very common sign of a stroke, okay? And so here the woman is being asked to hold her arm up, and she holds it up, and then one arm drifts down. Okay, so why is, you know, why is a stroke a medical emergency? Why is it called, why is it time to call 911? The number one reason that it's a medical emergency is that we have to very quickly restore blood flow to the brain before permanent damage sets in. Um, remember the initial comments that I made that the brain does not store energy and it needs const a constant supply of blood flow throughout the brain. And if there's a blockage of blood flow for really any period of time, permanent injury begins to set in. So the biggest reason it's a, it's a medical emergency is that we have to act very quickly to restore blood flow to the brain to prevent permanent damage from happening. Okay, second is that the chances of being successful in restoring blood flow to the brain uh, go down as time goes by, because basically that clot gets harder and harder and harder, and the clot propagates, it gets bigger. You know, more blood basically scabs up along, the, along the, the clot, and so the chances of actually successfully breaking down that clot and restoring blood flow to the brain go down with time. So the faster that we can administer medication or get to the clot, then the higher the chance of success. Okay, and the chances of having complications of treatment, like bleeding in the brain, um, go, uh, go, uh, basically go up the longer time that you wait. So the more permanent damage that already sets into the brain, if you actually are successful at restoring blood flow to a big part of the brain that's already dead, then the chances are, that are higher that you'll actually have bleeding to that part of the brain. And so the sooner that you can get to it, the lower your chances of having complications of treatment. Um, and, then, and then the last factor is that we really need to identify what the cause of the stroke was to prevent more strokes from happening. Okay, so what is the treatment of stroke? Since 1996, the only medication for stroke that's been approved by the Food and Drug Administration is called TPA, okay? Who's heard of TPA? How many people in the room have heard of TPA? That's it? No. That's all? Okay. TPA. Uh, TPA is actually a naturally occurring chemical in your body. It stands for tissue plasminogen activator, which is actually a, a, 
a, a chemical that your body makes to break down clots. And so in this case, the, the pharmaceutical agency actually manufactures that naturally occurring chemical um, and bottles it, and it's called TPA. And TPA has to be administered through the vein, okay, through an IV. It's not a pill, okay, it has to be given through an IV. It's a one-time shot that's given over an hour. Um, and it has to be given as, as soon as possible after the onset of symptoms. And so it's been on the market for almost 20 years at this point. Um, and then the newer treatment um, that actually uh, we've been working on for, for over a decade but is finally now in guidelines and is now considered the standard of care for some strokes is called mechanical thrombectomy. And what mechanical thrombectomy is is actually going into the blood vessel and um, using a, a device to actually grab onto that clot and pull it out. Now in this picture there's not a clot there but you can see this kind of spring which is a stent so you deploy this spring within the blood vessel and it grabs onto the clot and then pulls it out. Um, and here's an example here. You know, again, carotid artery coming up, blockage of a big branch of the carotid artery here, so there's no blood flow further on. Um, and then after treatment, the blood clot is taken out and then blood flow is restored to the brain. And this is from a real patient that we treated with mechanical thrombectomy. This little thing right here is actually a blood, the blood clot that was taken out by Dr. Lee, um, who's the doctor who performed the procedure and pulled the clot out. And so now, you know, fortunately, there's two treatments for stroke. One is TPA, which is an IV medication, um, and the other is called mechanical thrombectomy. Now, not everybody can get thrombectomy because it's only for the big <gasps> pipes that are blocked, the small blood vessels deep in the brain we can't get to at this point, and those are still treated with the IV medication, TPA. And in fact, the two treatments are not mutually exclusive, so there are patients who we treat with TPA first, and then we take to the um, angiography cath lab um, and try and pull the clot out if, if the clot has not resolved with the medication alone. So the key really is how quickly the patient, a, a person can be treated though. Now, th these treatments exist, but they have to be, have to be um, given within a very short period of time after blood flow is blocked. And the reason for that is that when you block one of the big pipes at the base of the brain, every minute that goes by, 1.9 million brain cells die. Okay? So it's a huge number of brain cells that are lost. And even if you restore blood flow to the brain, those, those brain cells are, are already dead. Okay? And if you wait too long and you restore blood flow to a lot of dead tissue, that, then patients have a lot of swelling of the brain, they can have bleeding, and they can die from that. And so it's very, very important that you know, every minute counts. After the, after the symptom onset, literally every minute that goes by, you're losing millions of neurons. And so it's really uh, very important that not just that people be treated and be treated within a certain time period, but really that a person is treated as quickly as, as humanly possible. Okay, and so to kind of put some pictures on this, these are the, the, the first pictures that I showed you. Okay, again, blockage of this blood vessel to the brain causing slow blood flow or lack of blood flow to this whole area of the brain. And so when this blood vessel gets blocked, you start losing 1.9 million brain cells in this whole area of the brain for every minute that goes by. And so I'm going to show you four pictures from four real patients, four patients that I treated, and all four of them had exactly the same condition. They all had blockage of this blood vessel on the left side of the brain. And if they hadn't been treated, they would have had, all had a stroke that looked exactly like this area of the brain. Um, and all four of the patients were treated with TPA, okay, the clot buster medication. And all four of the patients, the next day when we did an MRI, the blood vessel was open again. Because so the medication was successful in restoring blood flow to the brain. The only difference between these four patients is how quickly they were treated. Okay? And so I'll just show you four pictures to really illustrate what I mean when I say time is brain. Okay, so this patient was lucky enough to be treated within an hour and a half of the onset of symptoms, okay? Um, and we restored blood flow, and the patient still had a stroke, okay? There's still a stroke here, um, kind of at the margin, like here, at the, at the margin of the area that's not getting blood flow. So the patient still had a stroke. Um, he stayed four days in the hospital, was discharged directly home, um, and had minimal disability, did not need physical therapy. 
Okay, this patient was treated half an hour later, two hours from the onset of symptoms. And you can see, you know, a lot of that tissue is spared here, but the patient still has some stroke at really the margins of the area where the, where the blood flow goes. And so this patient stayed five days in the hospital and was discharged home, but still had some disability um, with weakness of the right hand and needed physical therapy at home. This patient was treated 40 minutes later than the last one, two hours and 40 minutes from symptom onset. These are not long periods of time. I mean, TPA can be given for most patients within four and a half hours of symptom onset. So all these patients are treated within the time window that we would consider patients eligible for TPA. And these are not long periods of time. So just 40 minutes later, and you can see all this tissue, and we still help this person by restoring blood flow because this would have been the stroke if we hadn't. But you can see all this tissue is injured, and this patient stayed 10 days in the hospital and was discharged to, an inpa to, to rehab hospital of the Pacific, which is an inpatient rehab hospital. Pati the person was not able to go directly home and had some, some permanent deficits in language and, and right-sided weakness from the stroke. And then this person, unfortunately, was treated really at the tail end of what we consider the treatment window, uh, three hours and 50 minutes from symptom onset. And, and again, we, we were able to restore blood flow to the brain. So the next day when we did imaging of the blood vessel, it was open. The medication did its job. It's just that it did its job too late, and then all this part of the brain was injured. Okay, so a little bit about TPA, okay. So the, the, the good news about TPA is that it's effective, okay. It's effective at improving your chances of surviving a stroke and also improving your chances of fully recovering from a stroke, okay. The bad news is that those time windows are very short. It has to be given within, you know, really ideally within 90 minutes. I mean, People who do very well after get, people who have stroke symptoms and do very well with TPA get treated within 90 minutes. You can be treated out to four and a half hours, but it's diminishing returns. Your chances of having a full recovery get lower and lower over time. And the really bad news about TPA is that most people don't get it. And so here's the data from Hawaii. And this is real, this is local data here, okay, statewide data going from 2010, 2011, 2012, out to 2015. This is about halfway through the year when I did this, when I collected this data. And we started at 3.6% treatment rate in 2010, and then we uh, hit 6.4% halfway through 2015. So the numbers are going up. You know, we've doubled the number of patients that we treated in the last five years. But you're still talking about 94% of patients who have strokes in the state of Hawaii are not being treated with the only medication that's been proven to be effective for treatment of stroke patients. We're only treating about 6% of patients in the state with strokes. And the biggest reason for that is people not recognizing that they're having a stroke or waiting to come in and not being treated. That's the number one reason that people don't get treated. And to put some, some real numbers on it, in 2014, which is the last year I had complete annual data for, only 171 patients in the state were treated out of those 3,000 patients who had strokes. Only 171 patients got treated with TPA. And again, it's a lot of it's because um, people don't arrive in the hospital quickly enough to get treated. Okay. So what do you do if you or a loved one is having symptoms of a stroke? I mean, the key is that time to call 911, okay? And it's not, and I'm not saying time to go to the emergency room, okay? Time to call 911, that's the important thing. Don't drive to the hospital. If you're, if you're having a stroke or you have a loved one who's having a stroke, don't drive that person to the hospital, okay? And if you're having symptoms of a stroke or you're home with somebody who's having symptoms of a stroke, don't wait for somebody to come home and drive you to the hospital. Now, there's a lot of good reasons. And the reason that I'm emphasizing that is because in Hawaii, only 60% of people who are having a stroke arrive by an ambulance. 40% okay? either walk in or they come by private vehicle. And, and, and that's a bad idea for a variety of reasons. Okay? One is that, well, you certainly don't want to drive yourself if you're having stroke symptoms, right? Because you could have an accident on the way to the hospital. But you also don't want to wait for a neighbor to drive you to the hospital or for a family member to come home from work and drive you to the hospital. 
Uh, one of the reasons for that is that not every hospital has a CAT scanner. Not every hospital has neurologists on the staff. Not every hospital is, has expertise in taking care of stroke patients. Um, and so a well-intentioned family member taking you to an emergency room may take you to an emergency room that doesn't have a CAT scanner. And if you don't have a CAT scanner, you can't safely treat a person with a stroke. Um, and, and sometimes the opposite, you know, I, I, so I, I can't tell you actually how many times I've seen patients in the emergency room who arrive several hours after the stroke onset happened, and I asked them, why did you wait to come into the emergency room? And one of the, you know, really heartbreaking and common answers that I get here at Queens, because I work at Queens, is that, well, I heard Queens is the best hospital for stroke. And I was worried that if I called 911, the ambulance would take me to a different hospital. Okay, and, I, and I've heard that that hospital is not as good at treating stroke. And so I, I called my daughter at work, and she came home from work, and she drove me to Queens because I heard Queens is the best. And, and, I, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. And so that's why I really wanna emphasize that call 911, because 911, and I'm gonna talk about this at the end here, the ambulance is only gonna take you to a hospital that will treat you, you know, that has expertise at, at treating stroke and does a good job at treating stroke. Um, and they'll take you there right away, okay? And so the point is not to delay and not to come in by private vehicle. And so don't, you know, don't wait to see your primary care doctor. Definitely call your primary care doctor, but don't wait to see your primary care doctor the next day. Um, and, and what I like to say is that stroke care begins in the ambulance, okay? And that's why it's important to call 911. Okay, so the reason I say stroke care begins in the ambulance is that because me and other neurologists um, and other, um, you know, interested physicians and, and, and hospitals, we're working together with the state to make sure that paramedics in the ambulance are able to recognize a stroke, okay? And they do something called the Los Angeles Pre-Hospital Stroke Screen, which is a very quick test. It's, it's a couple questions and a quick physical examination, and it tells them with a very high degree of certainty if a person is having a stroke or not. Okay, so they do this very quick test in the back of the ambulance, and if they see signs of a stroke, then they have a protocol that they follow, which says we only take patients to certain hospitals, hospitals that we know have CAT scanners and we know provide high quality stroke care, and we call ahead and tell the hospital, we are bringing you a patient with a stroke and our ETA is five minutes or 10 minutes, right? And that tells the hospital to activate their stroke system before the patient arrives. So what happens is somebody like me, if I'm on call for stroke, I get a page that says, there's, there's a stroke patient coming, come to the emergency room. And so I stop everything that I'm doing and I go to the emergency room and I'm standing there before the patient even arrives in the emergency room. And what that allows us to do is activate the whole system that has to move very, very quickly to get people scanned and treated and examined quickly before the patient even arrives at the emergency room. We can really start getting information and getting things set and that trims very precious minutes off the time. So that's why we say stroke care begins in the ambulance. That doesn't happen if you're in a private vehicle, right? Okay, so all that that I just described to you is really kind of encapsulated in the term stroke system of care. And what stroke system of care means is that we work together as hospitals and EMS, emergency medical systems, and the Department of Health in the state and we do public education about stroke, kind of some of the things that I'm talking about. We train paramedics to recognize stroke. We only take patients to hospitals that are capable of treating stroke patients from the ambulance. They call ahead, and then we do a closed loop, which is that we actually share quality data among all the hospitals. So all the hospitals actually share information about the quality of stroke care that they provide in sort of like a report card. And we have an organization called Hawaii Stroke Coalition where we actually look at the quality of stroke care that the hospital, all the hospitals in the state are providing and we make sure that it's a, it's a high quality of stroke care. And that's how we ensure that when we work together, we, we are, we're sure that the ambulance will only take a person who's having stroke symptoms to a, to a hospital that's providing high quality of care. Okay, and then I'm getting a little low on time, but I'm gonna finish up by talking a little bit about telemedicine, okay. And telemedicine is basically using technology, using computers, kind of like people use FaceTime or Skype, right? The ability, real-time video telecommunications so we can see 
and examine and talk to patients who are, who are separated from distance, right? So I can see patients in emergency rooms of hospitals that I'm not physically located at through computers. Okay, and that's what we call telemedicine. And so at Queens, we have a telemedicine project where we actually provide stroke coverage. We may not be the only stroke doctor. In some cases, they have a local stroke doctor and we supplement what they have. In other cases, we are the only stroke, stroke doctor there. But we actually provide stroke coverage for seven hospitals in addition to Queens, seven hospitals in the state. And so when we're on call for stroke, we're actually on call for stroke patients who come here to the emergency room at Queens. But we also use these technologies to examine and see and treat patients with strokes at seven other hospitals in the state by telemedicine. And that's again why, why I can tell you that if, you, if a person is having a stroke and they call 911, they may actually see me even if they're not at Queens. If the ambulance takes that person to Molokai or to Queens West or to Wahiwa or in some, or North Hawaii or sometimes in Maui, sometimes at Hilo um, and at Kona, then they could actually, that person could actually see me even though I'm not physically located at that hospital and get the exact same care that I would provide. I mean, sometimes I can treat patients faster at one of those other hospitals than I can here at Queens because if I'm up at my office at Queens and there's a, a stroke patient coming into our emergency room, it might take me 10 minutes to get downstairs, right? Especially if we didn't get called ahead of time. Whereas if the patient is at Wahiwa and has a stroke and they call me, it only takes me a minute to log on to the computer and I might be able to see that patient right away. And so um, it's important that everybody know that even if there's not a stroke expert physically located every hospital in the state, every hospital that the ambulance would take you to if you're having a stroke or if a loved one was having a stroke has access to a stroke neurologist either in person or by telemedicine. Okay, and this is an example of the, this is actually Queens West in the emergency room. This is the telemedicine cart. So you could see the doctor on call here, and then there's a camera um, that we can remotely drive with a computer to examine the patient. Just some close-up shots. And so to date, uh, the project has been up and running for four years. It's actually funded by a grant from the Department of Health, so your tax dollars at work, okay? Those special funds that you're always reading about in the newspaper that they're trying to take away, right? This is actually funded by a Department of Health special fund for neurotrauma. And the project has been active for about four and a half years. Um, and so far, we've seen 250 patients with strokes by telemedicine, and we treated 95 of them with TPA, the clot buster medication. So you can see that, you know, unlike 6% of the general stroke population that's being treated, we're treating, you know, um, a little less than half of patients, you know, around 30 to 40% of patients that we see by telemedicine. Um, and, and then the other number that I highlighted here is that of those 250 patients that we were able to see with telemedicine who are having strokes at other hospitals, we only needed to transfer 66 of them. And what that means is a lot of people, especially on the neighbor islands, were able to remain in their communities and still receive state-of-the-art treatment and be seen by a stroke expert without having to travel to Oahu or ha without having to travel across the island. Okay. Um, do I... Did I get to go over? Okay. All right. So, so I'm going to finish up with a few words about stroke prevention. Okay. So this is, this is sort of the, the good news is that you can make changes to lower your risk of having strokes or you can uh, advise your loved ones to make changes in their life that can actually reduce their chances of having a stroke. And so one person in five during the course of the lifetime will have a stroke. Okay, so what can you do to make sure you're not that one person or lower your chances of having a stroke? Okay, one is quit smoking. And the, the good news about quitting smoking is that if you're a smoker and you quit smoking, that in five years after you quit smoking, your chances of having a stroke are the same as if you never smoked. I think once people smoke for 20, 30 years, they say, well, the damage is already done. There's really no point in quitting. That's really not true. So if you quit smoking in five years, your chances are the same as if you never smoked. Okay, well, the other is diet, dietary uh, changes in your diet. And so actually Jen, who's our stroke coordinator is outside, has an example of this, which is the Mediterranean diet, okay? And I think you can review that um, after the talk. Okay, and then the other is uh, preventive health which, health, which is having regular appointments with your primary care physician. 
Most importantly for measuring blood pressure, okay, and blood pressure is the silent killer, so you, there's not symptoms necessarily. I have high blood pressure, okay, I take two medications to lower my blood pressure, um, even though I'm, you know, physically active and you wouldn't necessarily look at me and think that you have high blood pressure and I don't feel like I have high blood pressure. Um, I have very bad high blood pressure and I take uh, two medications at high doses that I need to take every day to control my blood pressure. And so um, you don't know that you have high blood pressure unless you measure it. And so regular appointments with your doctor and when you're out and about at longs, for example, measuring the blood pressure and treating high blood pressure. Um, and so just some target numbers to keep in mind. So the, the target blood pressure that we recommend for people is changing based on studies that have come out. Okay, we used to say 140 over 90 or sometimes 150 in older people. Systolic blood pressure, the upper number less than 120, okay, is the target. And diastolic, the lower number less than 80, okay. And that means a lot more Americans, a lot more people here in Hawaii are going to need to be treated to meet those targets with medications. And that's not such a bad thing. And then the cholesterol, lowering the cholesterol, the target is, for most people, is a bad cholesterol less than 130, okay, and the good cholesterol of over 60. All right, and then I think I, I need to finish up. So I'll just skip ahead and, and uh, ask what questions that you have. I, I told Lisa that I would probably finish early, by the way, because I didn't have that many slides. <laughs> So is the question, um, can stroke cause blur blurry vision? Is that? Sometimes you got blurry vision, could, could be migraine, headache, or mm -hmm. how could you tell the difference? Well, that's a, that's a tough one, and I have to tell you that um, a lot of times when, when stroke symptoms get missed, they're often related to blurred vision, because there's a lot of things that can cause blurred vision. Um, and so stroke, what stroke causes, when it causes visual problems, are blind spots in the vision, like not being able to see to one side, which again, people don't usually describe that as blurred vision. They describe it as bumping into things, okay? And the other one is double vision, okay? So if you see two images that are next to each other, diagonal or above each other, that can be a sign of a stroke. So usually just kind of, you know, if you stand up too fast and you're dehydrated and you get a little blurred vision, you sit down, it goes away. That's not, that's not a common cause of a stroke. It's usually something like bumping into things on one side because of blind spots, or actually double vision where you see two of the same image. That's an emergency. So the, so um, stroke doesn't usually cause pain uh, because the brain doesn't have a lot of sensation to it. Um, there are exceptions to that, and the bleeding strokes, so when you actually bleed into the brain or you have an aneurysm that ruptures and spills blood around the, around the brain, that's often described as the worst headache of, of the life. You know, so sudden onset, very severe headache can be a sign of bleeding in the brain. And there are exceptions, there is about, when there's an embolic stroke, like blood clot gets carried along the bloodstream and goes to the brain, about 10 to 15 percent of the time those can cause headache. Um, but for the most part, stroke is painless. And that's one of the reasons people delay treatment. Like if you're having a heart attack, you have crushing pain. Like pain leads you to call 911, right? If you're, not, if you're having something that's not painful, then often people are, are more likely to ignore that symptom. And stroke is generally not painful. Other questions? Please raise your hand. Um, yeah, so young people, so stroke is uh, more common as you get older, and so that's, that's a big risk factor for stroke is age, and so as you get older, your, your risk of stroke increases, 
Um, but young people can have strokes, and I've, I've treated patients in their 20s, 30s, 40s who have had strokes. Um, and again, it's, it's often rec unrecognized because a person, there's some element of denial, like I can't be having a stroke, I'm a healthy 30-year-old or 40-year-old, but I've treated many, many patients in their 30s and 40s who have strokes. Can be genetic, or it can be specific kinds of specific causes of stroke are more common in younger people. Some of the ones that I didn't go over, like younger people, can have a hole between the chambers of the heart, and blood clots can travel through that hole, and that causes strokes. That's a common cause of strokes in people in their 40s. Um, and then the bleeding strokes are definitely more common, um, and that's something I see very often here in Hawaii is people in their 30s and 40s. And mostly it's from blood pressure. You know, a person ha had high blood pressure and never went to the doctor and had high blood pressure probably from teenage years through the 20s and 30s and then have bleeding in the brain when they're 30 or 40. I see that very commonly. Uh, what strokes are more common here in Hawaii? Um, actually, the, 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 the strokes caused by bleeding in the brain are a little bit more common here. Aneurysms are more common in Hawaii. Um, on the, if you look at the U.S. mainland, you know, those two stroke types, the blockage of blood flow to the brain, ischemic stroke, that's 85%. And then the bleeding strokes is 15%. That's why I focus more on the blockages. Um, in Hawaii, actually, the number is a little higher for those bleeding strokes. It's about 25% of strokes here in Hawaii are caused by bleeding in the brain, and 75% are ischemic. And then the other, among the ischemic stroke, the one caused by blockage of the brain, the ones that are caused by narrowing of the blood vessels within the brain, those are very common here. Those are much more common here than they are on the mainland. That's rare on the mainland, actually. So in the mainland, those blockages in the neck, the carotid blockages that can be treated with surgery, those are much more common on the mainland, and they're pretty uncommon here. Some of that's the genetic factors. Some of it's probably lifestyle and some of it's genetic. It, so the question is, is there a relationship between obesity and strokes? And that's one of those slides I went click, 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 and just blew through. But. Certainly, there is a very important relationship, actually, between um, obesity and stroke. And so that slide that I blew through was about body mass index. And body mass index is a way of calculating the weight when you control for the person's height. Okay, it's the, it's the um, let's see if I can remember this. It's the weight in kilograms divided by the height in meters squared. Okay. Um, so, the, but the body mass index should be less than 25. So basically the ratio of your weight to your height should be less than 25. Um, and anything over that is considered either overweight or obesity. And um, that's a very clear risk factor for stroke. And it's tied up with things like diet, right? How much fat and cholesterol and fried foods that people eat and also exercise. Um, so it's hard to tease out, like, is it the obesity itself? Is it the sedentary lifestyle or the lack of exercise? Or is it the diet? Or is it some combination of those three? Yeah, that's one of those tough ones. That's, I'm going to file that with blurred vision because it's one of those tough ones because dizziness as a symptom is very common. Like what, you know, what percentage of people who come into the emergency room, their, their initial complaint is dizziness. It's probably like 20%, right? And so the symptom that we look for is, and, and when, so when a person comes to the emergency room and I see them or they, they see me in the hospital and they complain of dizziness, I always try to figure out what does that mean? Like if you had to describe your symptom without using the word dizziness, because uh, dizziness can mean different things to different people. Some people, dizziness means blurred vision. Some people, it means the room is spinning around me. Other people mean I, I can't walk. Um, other people mean I feel lightheaded or like I'm going to pass out. And the word dizziness describes all of those symptoms. And so the real 
symptom that concern, the two things that concern me when people say they're dizzy. One is a spinning sensation, right? If things are actually spinning around you, that can be other things. It can be an ear problem and, and other things other than a stroke, but a stroke can cause that symptom and we call it vertigo. Okay? Vertigo is a sense of movement or like things are spinning around you or your body is moving, right? And so that spinning feeling is, is definitely a concerning um, sign for stroke. Okay, and the other one is, is problems with balance and walking, particularly that walking like you're drunk or falling to one side. That can be a sign of stroke. So those are the types of dizziness that you know, are most concerning if a person is dizzy. Um, which is not to say that people who are lightheaded, that can never be a stroke, but it's, lightheadedness is very common and it's not often caused by stroke. With a, you mean listening with a stethoscope, is that right? I don't know, he just touches it. He touches it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I felt very feels it, and I'm, I'm not sure yeah. before why it was. So I th what your doctor is probably doing is, is listening for a carotid brewery, and a carotid brewery is a sound of turbulent blood flow. Okay, so like we talked about, if there's narrowing of that blood vessel, the blood flow becomes more turbulent. It's kind of like squeezing a hose. If you're gardening and you don't have a a nozzle on your hose and you squeeze the hose, the water comes out faster, right? So if you narrow the blood vessel in the neck with plaque, as the blood vessel, as the blood flows by, it, it whooshes by faster and it causes a high-pitched sound that we call a carotid brewery. And that can be a sign of narrowing of the blood vessels in the neck and that's probably what your doctor is listening for. Uh, certainly feeling your pulse and listening for heart sounds. So if there's a heart murmur, it could be a sign of a heart valve problem, which could... I have a heart murmur. Okay. <laughs> All right. What does that, what can happen to me with a heart murmur? Well, some heart murmurs are benign. You know, some heart murmurs are not, are not caused by valve problems, but it, it's something that, you're, you know, that you may need to have checked out to make sure that it's, it's just a benign heart murmur. Because sometimes the valves, the heart valves can have problems that can increase your risk of strokes and you'd have to look with the ultrasound. That would be the echocardiogram. The other reason, you know, feel for a pulse is to feel for that irregular heartbeat. The heartbeat should be regular, right? If the heartbeat is irregular, you know, meaning it's not like a fixed rhythm, right? If it's irregular, then that can be a sign of atrial fibrillation, which is definitely a, a big risk factor for stroke. So all that, you know, you could do very easily with physical examination. Yep. I mean, I can keep going. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll extend it to eight. How's that now? Uh, let's give another round of applause for Dr. Matthew Coding for taking the time this evening. And I also want to say mahalo to Jennifer Moran, uh, who you met outside. She's the stroke coordinator here at Queens. And how is she related to Dr. Koenig? She's his wife. I <laughs> uh, also like to thank um, Stroke, it's in the family, yeah? They're taking care of it. Uh, and I also like to thank Anthony Chen, who is the volunteer helping us this evening, and let you know about next month's lecture, which is going to be at the Queens Conference Center. It's on chronic kidney disease. So if you have diabetes, high blood pressure, poor circulation or family members who have chronic kidney disease, you could be at risk. So we're going to have Dr. Ramona Wong, who is a nephrologist, who's going to be talking about chronic kidney disease and the kind of things you can do to prevent it or monitor it. Uh, we'll also have Dr. Makoto Ogihara, who is a living, well, a kidney, don a kidney transplant surgeon, and he's going to be talking about living kidney donations and how that works. And he's also going to talk about kidney dialysis. We'll even have some uh, donor recipients and donors um, at, the, at the lecture so you can s talk to them and hear their story as well. Um, before you go, I want to make sure that you guys fill out that Speaking of Health evaluation form. It's really important uh, for us to guide us as to how to go uh, forward. And there's one question in particular about how did you hear about our lecture this evening? Um, you know, we're going to be determining how we best 
uh, let you know about these lectures. So how you answer that will determine whether we continue in certain uh, with flyers or with advertising. So it's very important if you could let us know where you heard about it. Okay, parking validations are outside with Anthony. Thank you for coming this evening and have a good evening. Good night.